what Earth Day means, what sustainability and climate change means during this time of disruption. And first, I want to welcome all our MIT friends and family that are here today. Thank you for joining, and, and hopefully you can get some insights out of the day. We, I also see a lot of our partners from our MIT CTL corporate exchange program. Thank you for joining. And all of you who are really taking the time today to cre think critically about sustainability and climate change during this during COVID-19. And before we get started, wherever you are, at your home, in your sweatpants, hiding from your kids, whatever you're doing, or on the front lines of supply chains, you know, all the support we're, we're seeing around the world, we hope that you and your family are safe and healthy. So we want to wish that and, and please keep that, um, we, that we're thinking about you at all times. So I want to start with a poll just to kind of see what, uh, why everyone is here today. So if you see a little poll, please take the moment to fill that out, you know, just recognizing, um, you know, we're all here for different reasons. So we can just think about that a little bit critically as we go through the session. So, you know, as your host today, Suzanne Green and I, my colleague at, at CTL and Sustainable Supply Chains, uh, we won research on su supply chain sustainability. And, and personally, we found ourselves thinking about what the future is going to look like during COVID-19 and what sustainability will mean uh, going forward. We're we were really looking for constructive, informed perspectives around the future of climate change and how do we keep motivated and really uh, keep our, our, our perspectives in this time that is so disruptive and, and, hard, and so easy to lose focus. And so we thought, you know, and, and why, and you think maybe why uh, supply chain researchers would bring together this type of session. And really, as we've all seen, supply chains connect to the world and it's making us see ourselves as a part of the bigger world, as, as individuals and organizations, as, as governments, right, that we're all interconnected. And so that really inspired us to bring together and think about these issues, not just about supply chains, but about organizations, about our role as individuals, and, and think a little bit more critically about that in, in the session today. And of course, we don't have all the answers, right? So no one's going to have the answers right now, but we wanted to think about some informed insights, thinking about perspectives we can take going forward. So hopefully you can come out of today with some, some new thoughts and some new inspiration that can continue to drive you during this time of uncertainty. And so we brought together experts across uh, that will bring insights about uh, roles of organizations ecologically, economically to kind of provide those perspectives. Um, so just to, I, I ran that poll real quick. I'll give you guys another minute um, to fill it out and so we can see why you're here today. And so we have, you know, where Suzanne, once I turn it over to her, we'll give a better intro of our, our panelists today. So as co-hosts, you see us up there and we'll ha we have some expert panelists today who are gonna talk about um, their thoughts in this time and, and she'll be giving a little bit more intro as we go along. But, you know, we ended last year, 2019 and started 2020, fairly positive about sustainability and climate change. And, um, you know, I think in 2019, you know, sustainability was, at an all time high, right? You know, if we're looking at very uh, physical and very uh, visible uh, representations of that, uh, you know, YouTube saw a 190% increase in posts about sustainability in 2018, 2019. Uh, engagements to climate change content on social media was up three times higher than ever before in the first nine months of 2019. Climate strikes and collaboration and, and cooperation around that topic was really at an all time high. So I think we ended last year, you know, very confident about our ability to work collectively to drive some of these issues forward. But then this year hit and we all know where we're at right now, right, which is there's a lot of open questions about what COVID-19 will be doing, you know, whether that is has a positive impact on the environment. Is it the acid test for conscious capitalism and commitment to sustainability? What's it going to mean for, you know, drive to, to minimize waste and plastics and these conversations that were active, you know, as of a few months ago? And, you know, are there negative parts of this that are going to really impact in our commitment? And so we want to think about that and, and bring these issues uh, today and, and obviously no answers, but are not, not, we don't have all the answers, but can we think about that constructively moving forward? And really, you know, again, we now recognize ourselves as one part of this greater world. Can we overlook, can we see across our differences, our functions and, and re rethink about our values and our roles and, and kind of think of ourselves as this collective 
you know, a group of individuals globally. And so we, we wanted to we'd talk about those issues uh, as well today. And, and one thing that, you know, we had, Suzanne and I have been thinking about as supply chain researchers is what does this look like in terms of timeline? You know, we, we recognize that at the end of 2019, early 2020, we were seeing some of the most op optimistic movements in sustainability in particular for supply chains, but, but broadly and globally, but then seeing 2020 as a, as a clear disruption and recognizing that, you know, our, our roles as individuals and, and, and global citizens is to serve pandemic needs right now, committing to stay home, committing to, to, to your function to enable and get through this pandemic. But what does, you know, 2021 and 2022 look like going forward? How can we recover and re redesign more strategically so that we aren't going back to the same way and that, I, in fact, we're recovering better and we might see our purpose differently. We might revisit our values differently so that we aren't going back to the norm, but we're going back better. So we're hoping, you know, and we're looking to some insights today. And just as a, as a quick um, kind of uh, perspective on why everyone is here today. So well, only 21% of you said you love Earth Day, but I was hoping 100%, but we, we all love Earth Day. Um, I wanna learn more about the environment is, is pretty high in the list, 42%. Um, and I want to position myself in a, 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 to support a more sustainable recovery, recovery. but um, I really, in particular, the biggest was I want to better understand current events about sustainability. So I think we're all here for very good purposes. Um, and so now I'm going to take, uh, to turn this over to my colleague, Suzanne Green, who's the manager of sustainable supply chains to talk about our agenda today. And, uh, and what we and will and our panelists and introduce our panelists. I'll pop it back to our slide where we have those on there. Oops. Great. Thank, thanks, Alexis. Um, thanks everybody for joining. I'm really excited to be here and to celebrate this Earth Day, 50 years of Earth Day with you all. And you know, part of the reason why we wanted to do this is that you know we hear a lot of kind of conflicting news about you know, sustainability and the environment in this time of crisis. So, you know, on one hand, I've heard some good news, right? We see clearer air, cleaner air, um, wildlife maybe seems happier. And, and, you know, we see sea turtles where they haven't been before and some pieces of very good news. Um, but we're viewing it from inside, right? We want to be out there in the world and experience this for ourselves. So I think we kind of can see a glimpse of the world we we want, this low carbon future that we want to see. Um, but how can we make this a reality in in the real world and in under um, better circumstances? So that that's the conversation we want to have today and to share with you. Um, so we brought together an amazing panel of our colleagues. Um, we're really excited that they could join us today. We have um, Julie Newman, who's the MIT's Director of Sustainability and a lecture, lecturer in the Department of Urban Studies and Planning. We have Professor John Fernandez, the Director of the Environmental Solutions Initiative and the Urban Metabolism Group. And we also have Chris Knittel, the Director of um, the Center for Energy and Environmental Policy Research at MIT Sloan School. Um, so an amazing panel. Um, We'll hear from each person today and then we'll have some time for questions. So please feel free to put questions at any point into the chat box and we'll get to them at the end. Um, so for now, I can turn it over to Julie. So thanks, thanks so much for joining us, Julie. Great, <clears throat> thank you so much. Can you hear me okay? Great, good afternoon everyone. And thank you to Alexis and Suzanne for organizing this important discussion and raising such good questions in your introduction and even your inspiring idea of building back better. I continue to hear that in meetings I've been in and air, uh, articles I've been reading. But undoubtedly, this is one of many essential discussions that will take place on this topic at MIT and beyond. And to be honest, I never imagined celebrating the 50th uh, anniversary of Earth Day inside, online, while homeschooling a nine-year-old and working full-time and in the midst of a pandemic. Um, I've come of age in this time and built a career on a vision for a sustainable world and am more determined than ever to come together with many of you to inform and actualize this vision. And in this time frame, 
we have come together as a world to develop the sustainable development goals, which I think a few of us will hit upon, and the Paris Agreement, and many other such international treaties and commitments. So that is not that that we're wired to do that. And on the other hand, we have pushed our natural systems, and as we all know now, also our healthcare systems to the brink. So we have some challenges on our hand, and also uh, some great knowledge and experience to bring forward. And I think we are all experiencing a moment in time that we never could have imagined. And as we reimagine the future together, higher education will play an important role uh, in informing our thinking and understanding of the future that we seek to rebuild. And it's also become clear to me that we have immense responsibility in contributing to how we rebuild and reimagine our future and to pay close attention to what has surfaced in only these first few weeks and months um, of the pandemic. And it sounds like many of you online are in that are interested in that, in that same level of contribution. So as the director of sustainability at MIT, my team and I founded our office to transform MIT into a powerful model to generate new and proven ways of responding to the unprecedented challenges of a changing planet. And that's a term we now hear over and over again but this moment in time has brought brand new meaning to the term unprecedented challenges of a changing planet. And one that we together with collective wisdom need to continue to more deeply explore and understand. I'm hoping today's conversation begins to, or rather continues to help frame what, what we even mean by that. You know, MIT has embraced sustainable development and climate change as defining challenges for the world's citizens in the 21st century and for MIT. And there's no backing down from that. That is still the case. And, and by the way, I urge many of you, uh, if you haven't seen it, to read President Reif's op-ed piece today in the Boston Globe, in which he reflects upon the lessons we're learning from COVID-19, the important and essential role of science, and then how MIT, at MIT we can apply those lessons in solving for climate change and rebuilding our, our economy. So it's still at the heart of MIT's commitment. And at MIT, we have framed our commitment to sustainability as the need to promote health and well being for a growing world population while reducing our global footprint to within Earth's capacity to sustain us. That's in our Pathways to Sustainability document. But in the face of COVID 19, we need to revisit the meaning of this as well. And not only that, it's really time for us to accelerate and scale our research and actions to advance this commitment. We have to bring this forward. So I have uh, two parts to my comments that I'd like to share today. And the first part is in regards to considering the scales of impact and resiliency that I'd like to share with you, which is really at the heart of MIT's campus sustainability commitment. Uh, and the part two is as how we might go about reconsidering and reimagining acting on this at MIT. So uh, next slide. So when we launched the Office of Sustainability at MIT, we launched on this platform that we've already heard referenced today, which is considering the scales of impact of our work in the context of the role of the individual, the campus, the city, and the globe. And of course, I think what's even more relevant today is the role of the, the scale of the state, which isn't in there, but and you know, scales across that, and we can add the state in there. And from climate mitigation and resiliency to consumption, waste management, and supply chains, this framework guides our thinking already. And so, for example, when we design and evaluate our carbon mitigation efforts to achieve carbon neutrality, we explore what needs to take place at the level of the individual actor, the infrastructure on the campus, in collaboration with the city, in the context of an evolving grid, and of course, in the uh, context of global, uh, the global energy context. And we seek to understand the interactions of economic systems, local to global, policy, infrastructure, technology, and behavior, to name a few of the important dynamics and informed by the very best science coming out of our institutions. And so pathways to carbon neutrality cannot, it will not be achieved at one scale alone uh, moving forward. And I just share this as an example and its approach with you today, as I believe that considering the role at these scales at the individual campus, city, state, globe in an iterative manner will serve us as we move through and beyond COVID-19. And, and as we carry forward lessons uh, learned and behaviors we have so quickly adapted today um, 
and apply them to solving for carbon neutrality, sustainable development, and others. Next slide. So I've referenced this several times, but moreover, we have a global roadmap that does not necessarily need reinventing in this time. We have 17 sustainable development goals that present us with a set of shared global uh, common, uh, common values, shared global goals that call upon us to solve for health, well-being, poverty, inequality, climate change, consumption, urban design, industrial systems. These can all tie back to the disciplines and expertise within MIT as well. And there's going to be a need and a reaction to rebuild the economy and our communities quickly. And we have to keep in mind a set of shared principles to consider in that time and, and to use these to inform our, think our thinking, or we're gonna end up in this cycle again and again and potentially more rapidly. Next slide. Moreover, our skills of impact also need to re-inform how we rebuild a resilient society. And we must begin, I think what's happening today is we're being forced to consider inner resilience as we are shelter in place, individual resilience as we interact with our families and colleagues, uh, you know, either at home or, or via Zoom, uh, internet. Um, organizational resilience, as we're experiencing in a whole new way by managing, we're managing a 20,000 person organization remarkably online. We have to consider community resilience, uh, planetary resilience, so, so many layers, and we must plan for these scales of resiliency concurrently as they are absolutely interdependent. And I think we've lost track of that interdependency and it's come forth right, it's, it's, it's what we're living today. So coming out of COVID-19, we must embrace and deepen our interconnectedness and the boundaries and understanding between the role of these scales must become more transparent. We must make them more deliberate in our decision-making. So final slide. So as we consider the future of sustainability at MIT and beyond, the work that we'll be doing to rethink, to, to reconsider and repurpose and continue our work both online and when we eventually return to campus is we'll think about how we're gonna to continue to design for sustainability, hopefully at an accelerated pace and applying what we know now, lessons we're learning today, bringing them forward and also redefining what we value. And I think again, those I think even starting with today's conversation, those issues are coming forth and are gonna actually potentially be easier to talk about. We're going, to, we're going to have to reconsider how we design for choice, empowering community members to have an impact and understand the impact that they can have. And again, today we're recognizing the important role of individual choice in just uh, reducing the curve, flattening the curve around COVID. It's going to be the same opportunity as we look at climate change, um, engaging supply chains, et cetera. And the final piece here is to reconsider how what, how and what we prioritize to solve for. At MIT, we're pioneering new frontiers in sustainability, climate, public health, uh, equity, and we need to bring those to the forefront of our, of our efforts. And we're, uh, we're nicely positioned to do that. So in conclusion, now more than ever, we have a shared responsibility and global responsibility that crosses in disciplines and calls upon all levels of expertise to contribute. We face a health crisis, a climate crisis, an environmental crisis, an education crisis, as I'm experiencing firsthand, a food crisis, a supply chain crisis, and now an unprecedented economic crisis. And we must figure out how to invest in sustainable economies as we seek to heal and rebuild. We will need to consider new collaborative leadership models right from the get-go, as we're experiencing today already, informed by data and science, and to respond to these crises, not only in the near term, but plan for the long term. And we, we will need to revisit and strengthen our development model and foster new between people in the natural environment. Informed collective path forward outlined by the Sustainable Development Goals, the Paris Agreement, and the international fees. And we have the infrastructure across higher education, municipalities, industries, NGOs, and many state governments to join forces in a collective effort. So let's not celebrate another day inside and in solitude. It's time to come together with collective wisdom, caring, and informed action to move forward. So thank you again for including me in this, and I look forward to the discussion and hearing from my good colleagues. 
Thank, thank you so much, Julie. That was really interesting and insightful. Um, thanks a lot for that. Um, do you have questions for Julie? Please put them in the Q&A and we'll get to them um, after the talk. So please enter your questions. And next up, we'll have John Fernandez. So John, the, the floor is yours. Thanks. Great. Uh, Alexis, uh, Suzanne, thank you for the invitation. Uh, thrilled to be here. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna go through a few ideas um, on the on the second slide, so you can you can go to that slide. Um, the The bulk of my ten minutes um, I'll spend on this slide because I I, I want to get to some key top key ideas and that are relevant to to our situation, but also connect to the research that we've been doing for a few years. So uh, beginning with uh, climate change. Um, I'm going to be talking about climate, environment, and cities. Um, and beginning with climate change, um, I think it's a good time to remember some basic facts about climate change um, and also to, to sort of note how um, the progression of climate change um, is relevant to our situation and different from our situation. So climate change, the first bullet here is it, it, it it happens slowly until it doesn't. Um, we've got accelerating trends, extreme events and tipping points. And two, these two quotes I've, I've heard in the last couple of days from a couple of different people. So similarly, you know, how do you go bankrupt? Ernest Hemingway wrote two, two ways, gradually and then suddenly. It, it comes upon you and then all of a sudden you're bankrupt. Uh, climate change is, is like that in the sense that it's happening suddenly and all of, it's happening slowly around the world. And then all of a sudden there's a superstorm that uh, is being attributed to, or there's sunny day flooding being attributed to, or Australian fires being attributed to climate change or are exacerbated by climate change. The, the second quote there I think is also telling, there are decades where nothing happens and there are weeks where dec decades happen. And those weeks we're in now. Um, and it's very interesting to me to continue reading all the articles that pose parallels between climate change and the global pandemic, because I think a lot of them are making parallels um, uh, that are interesting. Um, and I disagree with a number of parallels that, that are being made. I think Chris actually could, could speak to the unique nature of climate change, um, like no other environmental problem. Um, I'm, and I'm, I'm saying that because I'm referring back to an op-ed that I read, Chris, that you wrote uh, a, few, a few months ago, LA Times, it, it seems to come to mind. Um, so, so a few things about climate change that are, that are different and really unique is that it's here to stay. So it's essentially irreversible certainly in our lifetimes and certainly for many generations. I'm referring to a Susan Solomon paper of 2016. She's a, a professor in earth atmospheric and planetary sciences, which shows pretty clearly, primarily because of the residence time of CO2 in the atmosphere of several hundred years to a thousand years that whatever effect uh, radiative forcing and warming of the atmosphere is essentially here to stay. Um, uh, can be reduced, certainly, with really, really aggressive reductions in carbon emissions. But, but we're in the midst of a very, very long-term change that we're, that we're going to adapt to, we're going to have to adapt to. Climate change is also going to affect everything. And, you know, the, the list is endless and everyone, but unfortunately, unequally in, and inequitably. So unequally geographically, uh, different parts of the world will feel it very differently and inequitably because we simply do have different vulnerabilities um, around the world based on income and the conditions of the city or the countryside or whatever, whatever it is, or the, or the state of infrastructure. And I think it's just good to remind ourselves that um, I've read a number of articles, I'm sure everyone has, that this is a model for us to act on climate change. And you know we can come out of this with you know, achieving our goals. And I, I, I wanna be optimistic, but I also wanna um, 
be be tethered to reality because uh, to stay under two degrees, um, CO2 emissions has to be reduced by about 7% a year. That's extraordinarily aggressive. Uh, and just keep in mind that by 2050, to be able to hit the two degree goal and avoid catastrophic consequences, we really need to reduce carbon emissions by about 85% and then, and then enable negative emissions technologies. Um, that is happening at the same time that we will have about a 30% increase in the global population. So, so the challenge is, is extraordinary, unprecedented, and you know, may, maybe everyone on the call already knows all of that. So I'm going to focus in on, on the city scale. Um, it's, the, it's the work that I do with my group in urban metabolism and in the Environmental Solutions Initiative. Recently, we've started up a group uh, focusing on cities and climate change. And I think some of the things that we're learning today are, are relevant. So the city and metropolitan, and less so the regional, but I'm including it here, level of governance and, and control of resources under crisis is really critical. We've seen that the pre-positioning of assets, the mobilization of assets to, um, to, to address the, 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 the crisis situation at a variety of scales is important, but the, the, the way in which resources are distributed and, and decision-making is made, at least here in the United States, um, the city and the metropolitan region are, are really critical um, to, to, to response. Um, resilience can be created during stable times. So we, one, one thing that I think we will come out of this crisis with a better understanding that investment um, in times outside of crisis is extremely important. There are, and, and of course, in the United States, FEMA and other go government organizations are, are meant to do that. And they typically have not um, to, the, to the extent that's needed. But I wanna highlight a couple of, um, well, so one instance in particular of a change in uh, industry practice after Hurricane Sandy hit New York City. So it's now very typical in, in lower Manhattan, and this is completely voluntary. This is by way of the, the building designers and engineers making a decision that the control rooms and the mechanical, uh, um, the, the mechanical services for the building are, have been elevated above the second floor, typically in most building, in most new development. This is, as I said, completely voluntary. It's not mandated by code, but this is an adjustment that the, that the real estate industry has made in Manhattan and real estate industry in Manhattan doesn't make changes very often. And they do so only uh, at, at um, in, in times only under pressure for losing the value of, of their asset. And so that's, that's a significant change in that particular market. Um, that's a good, that's a good, there's good evidence that we can learn and we can and shift our behavior. And it doesn't always have to be government mandated or, um, you know, uh, uh, in, instituted by, um, by organizations that have some regulatory power. Um, another topic I want to, um, I'll, I'll talk to a little bit in, in a later slide is that cities and nature, we, cities and nature, so human populations or concentrations of human populations in nature are ex inextricably linked. So the concentrations of extracted biomaterials and also our exposure to uh, nature, natural systems, wildlife, um, is extremely important to keep in mind. So for example, China after the coronavirus, vi coronavirus emerged, China has instituted a ban on, the, on, on wildlife in food markets. Um, and it's a temporary ban. Uh, it may become permanent. Um, there's a good bit of 
a writing that suggests that even if it is made permanent, those things don't really last. And there's a lot of, you know, a lot of loopholes that, that, that get around that. So for example, soon afterwards, uh, pigeons and rabbits were, were, uh, were, were labeled uh, livestock in China so that you can get around um, that. They're not wildlife anymore. But so we have to keep in mind our exposure to uh, ecologies that are under pressure and are, are, are being opened up and the novel um, viruses that may be coming out of that. We, um, and so overall, and I'm not gonna go into the next point in much detail, but I think let's just open it up for discussion. Climate change consequences are like the COVID-19 situation and are quite unlike the COVID-19 situation. I think, I think it would be really good to have a, a more nuanced discussion about, about that. And finally, the, one of the solution sets that is important for us to keep in mind is that the circular economy at the city level, and this is part of the work that we do in urban metabolism, is a, a really interesting and promising scale at which cities can build resilience. Resilience to climate risks, resilience to any kind of risk, any kind of security risk, uh, pandemic risk. So we are seeing that cities are able to um, control their, um, their situation and being able to do that in a low carbon future. So being able to build resilience into a city uh, it's it's important to consider that there are districts so uh, another scale uh, small, smaller than the city neighborhood scale in which resilience can be built in with smart grids with water harvesting even food production urban agriculture waste disposal and and use as an, an energy source and I think that's one of the things that will will be uh, an, an important conversation to take forward as we look to uh, protecting ourselves for fu from future crises. That certain, there is an emerging literature um, and discourse about designing and planning cities um, to be resilient to pandemics, but I think that we're, we're way too, uh, it's, it's an early, early discussion. So let me, let me finish just with a few slides. Next slide. And these are really just to illustrate. Next slide is the, the context here is that on the left, more than half the population now lives in cities. That's gonna continue for the next several decades uh, and probably peak at about 65 to 70% globally. So this is, a, this is a world of cities. On the right, uh, what's less well known is that our material extraction has become substantially of non-renewable materials starting in 1960s. So we extract more non-renewable than renewable materials. Next slide. That, that means that the kinds of materials that are targeted for a low carbon future are under pressure. So the rare earth metals and others, uh, you can click once. This is a diagram where that, this is the trend from right to left. This is uh, the, bot, the, the two under the area, the areas under the curve A and B signify B or a very high quality, but there's, a small amount of that, relatively speaking. And ore is a very low quality, but there's a lot of that towards the left. And for many primary metals, we're heading towards the left and we're hitting limits to the, the, the accessibility and the amount of high quality ore. So you hear about things like seabed mining of cobalt and other metals. Next slide. And we've done some work that shows that the relationship between resource consumption and income is complicated. So the left diagram shows the total number, the total amount of materials per year per capita. And with an increase in income, you have an exponential increase in material consumption in, in cities. The middle diagram is shows that there's a tight correlation between the increase in income and electricity consumption. And the right diagram shows an interesting property where in many cities, especially in developing countries, water, water consumption can, can be reduced per capita by way of efficiency and conservation um, policies. Next slide. So there are positive prospects for thinking 
about a circular economy that, that would build resilience into human settlements and cities where most of most of humanity is going to be living. So this is an example uh, of a waste to energy plant in China. This is a rendering. Next slide. And this is actually the thing in construction. So the the Chinese have have made a huge commitment to uh, encapsulating a circular waste to energy flow in several regions and the Shenzhen region, region is one of them. And so in terms of a circular economy and circular urban economy example, there are, there are real world examples. And, and I think this is very much the direction that we should be thinking about going. Next slide. And um, just to end this with, um, uh, again, a reality check on the, on the threats. This is the, a, a recent, estimate of the flooding in blue uh, in populated areas in Bangkok from a high tide storm surge. This is in Nature Communications recently published. And then the next slide shows the, revision, the, re, the better, more highly resolved um, later version of that. So this is what we, we know. This is actually um, a, a better estimate. And, and it shows that not only are the uh, consequences of climate change accelerating, but our, our understanding of those consequences are, are also becoming a little bit more dire. Next slide. And finally, the, the, the sense that there is a connection between cities and, and the biological world. So we're, the, we're doing work and there's, there are other groups around the world doing work on the connection between biodiversity in all its different facets and urban economies um, and, and urban consumption. I think that's it. Next slide. So thanks, thanks so much. I'll leave it at that and, and we'll move on to Chris. Thank you, John. That, that was super interesting and definitely a lot of things that I wanna look into and think more about um, after this. So now we'll turn it over to Chris. Um, couple slides here from Chris. Take it away. Great, thanks. Um, and Alexis and Suzanne, thank, thank you very much for having me. Um, I'm going to be fairly brief um, and more wanting to tee up some conversations that we might have about how the current economic times might influence sustainability, not just in the short run, but also leading out of uh, the current crisis and what to expect in the future. And of course, I think we have more questions than answers, um, but um, I, I'll try to bring some perspective in terms of what, what are the larger issues at, at play um, as, as the economy gets back going. Um, but before that, so this is the 50th year anniversary of Earth Day. Um, and I realize economists are usually asked to be on these panels to be sort of the wet blanket and the pessimist and the Debbie Downer. Um, so I'm gonna to try to break that mold a little bit. And I think it's worthwhile to celebrate some of the successes that we have had over the last uh, 50 years. Um, so I just quickly today went, went online to track uh, different pollutants um, since 1970, um, all the way up to 2017. So here's a graph of sulfur dioxide emissions in the US. Um, I think it's great that, and, and we should pat ourselves on the back that SO2 emissions have fallen by about 90% since, since 1970. Um, what you also see in this graph is right around 1990, the, the acceleration of that drop. And that points to the importance of policy. Um, and I'm gonna get to policy at the very end, but um, what that says is actually policymakers and regulations can actually have an effect. Um, so if we go to the next slide, I, I think I have NOx emissions, um, haven't fallen by as much, but still 40%. Um, in fact, now we mostly worry about NOx, not entirely, but we mostly worry about NOx as a, as a small particulate matter. Um, so in many, regions of the country, ground level ozone isn't as big of an issue as, as it used to be. Um, the next slide shows carbon monoxide emissions, um, I think. Um, 
if if not, um, okay, <laughs> I'll describe that to you then. Uh, so carbon monoxide emissions have fallen by 70% since 1970. And again, it shows the same pattern with NOx and uh, SO2 that in, in 1990 that accelerated uh, because of the Clean Air Act amendments of 1990. Um, and then uh, the next slide that I had uh, showed particulate matter, so fine particles. Um, it, it only went to 1990 because actually before 1990, we were just re measuring TSPs. Um, we, we didn't even differentiate between very fine particles like PM 2.5. Uh, but since 1990, PM 2.5 has fallen by 20%. Um, so th those are major successes um, that we've had uh, over the last 50 years. So of course, I didn't show uh, CO2 emissions, which would not have shown a decrease uh, since 1970. And, and that's what we're mostly talking about today. But every once in a while, it's good to remind ourselves that the environment on some dimensions, at least in local pollution, um, is much cleaner than it is than it was uh, in the 1970s. Um, so I don't think you have the rest of my slides. Maybe I sent the wrong file. Um, that's certainly, I'm sure that's my fault. Um, so the next slide that I had was, uh, or next couple slides, we're talking about what's happening in the economy um, or with emissions due to the coronavirus crisis that we're going through. Um, and the first thing to talk about is the short run. So in the short run, um, we're we see large reductions in pollution uh, about by our calculations, and we're writing this up, should be available soon. Uh, by our calculations, there's about a 20% decrease in US uh, carbon dioxide emissions relative to last year. Uh, the largest decrease has been in gasoline consumption. So gasoline consumption has fallen by about a half um, and certainly more uh, in other areas. But electricity consumption has also fallen, natural gas consumption as well. Um, and that decrease in gasoline consumption is despite the fact that uh, we had actually negative prices uh, for uh, oil futures contracts uh, just this week for the first time in the history of futures markets. Um, too bad we can't spend an hour on that. I'd love to talk about talk through that. Um, but you know, clearly, although this is a gain from a climate perspective, nobody uh, even mildly suggests that the, the net impact of this current crisis is not a, a huge negative. So everybody is trying to get out of the current crisis. And I think the next thing that we need to have a conversation about is how we do that in a way that protects the environment and protects uh, the trends that we've seen, at least partially, in uh, carbon dioxide emissions uh, in the U.S. And, and worldwide. And that's where, you know, I use the, the, the term, it's complicated in terms of how, as we get out of this current economic crisis, how emissions will, will flow or will, will respond to that. So the first thing to worry about, and this is now I'm putting on my economist uh, pessimist hat. Um, the first thing to worry about is that in recessions, uh, governments usually have smaller budgets um, and they might be using the budgets that they have for putting out fires somewhere else. Um, and that the first order effect is likely to slow down the transition to a low carbon economy. Uh, low, that transition requires investments, and it might very well be the case that governments, certainly at the federal level, perhaps also at the state level, will have less of an appetite uh, for that investment. Um, so it really will be as we move out of this recession, and we're likely to be in a recession soon, um, a fight between the recession is going to lead to less consumption of energy products. Um, electricity, gasoline consumption, and so on. So that'll be a pro climate change or a, a, an effect to reduce CO2 emissions. But at the same time, we probably won't see as quickly of a trend at decarbonizing emissions per unit. Um, and whether that's uh, solar and wind investment or investment in electric vehicles and so on. So the huge wild card here um, and 
then I could turn it over for discussion is gonna be policy. Um, and, you know, one could argue to, to use John's point, and I believe his pushback as, as to how climate change is very different from the coronavirus. But one might hope that the coronavirus has elevated the importance of science in our community um, and the importance of scientists and also elevated the discussion of externalities. Um, the coronavirus is an externality. You, you're, wear, you're asked to wear a mask, not to help yourself, but to help somebody else. Um, so the glass is half full argument in terms of the economics is that we will have more honest discussions about science, about technology, and about how we're all interrelated uh, on this globe. And that could potentially elevate the discussion of climate change. Am I optimistic that's going to happen? I'll say a lot of that optimism is going to depend on what happens in November. Um, and so policy is going to be important. And clearly, the next uh, major election in the US will, will be a driving force as to what that policy going forward looks like. So with that, I'll stop and happy to take questions. Thanks a lot, Chris. That was great. And sorry if we missed some of your slides. Um, but OK, so I know there's a lot of great questions in the Q&A. If you have questions, please put them in there. If we can't get to them today, we'll find a way to answer them. So um, I'll turn it over to Alexis now um, to moderate the Q&A. Yeah, thanks. Thanks uh, to John, Julie, and Chris. That was super insightful and, and helpful in thinking, framing kind of the situation we're in now. And just for kind of a, a quick, uh, we'll, we'll grab what slides uh, the speakers are available, are willing to share, and we can post those. So in case we miss some from the session today that you guys can review them. And, and so we'll make that available following the event, um, what's available to share. So as we're kind of going through some questions, um, I wanted to uh, I wanted to get a little bit more polling just to see some perspectives, you know, in terms of how you guys are involved in sustainability and what that's going to mean. And I'll be directing, uh, we had uh, uh, created some of our own questions, but since we're running short on time, I'm going to go straight to um, uh, your questions so that we can ask as many as possible and direct those. And, and John, Julie, and Chris, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of select a, a person I think this is most relevant to, but feel free to jump in if you want to add insights to any of the questions that I um, am highlighting now. So one question that Samit asks is uh, to John in particular is, do you mean that in, uh, in terms of will megacities eventually move to transform to be smaller, symbiotic and sustainable units following this? Do you think there will be impact there? Yeah. So. Um on the first, uh, smaller, um, not necessarily. So um, the UN world projections for urban populations still shows that um, we're gonna see some really enormous growth in urban populations. So for example, Lagos is projected to have a population of 88 million in 2100. Uh, you know, 88 million people, that's quite, quite a large city. So, and, and, there, and Kabul, 50 million if you can believe it. So, I mean, there's, there's, we're in the midst of unprecedented urban population growth. Now, having said that, uh, the, the city, cities cannot actually grow on the basis of a centralized distribution of resources. They have to actually develop cells that have their own power plants and their own water system and their own waste, waste treatment uh, systems and and there's the opportunity and not to uh, plan and grow in the way that large cities have so far, but to actually disaggregate units, even if it's part of the larger city, and provide for that you know uh, last mile low carbon trans mass tra uh, mass transportation, uh, local food, harvested water, all of that. So that's there's there's a real there's real promise in that, given that we are going to see mega cities continuing to grow much, much larger. I'm not sure I captured all of the parts of that question, but. Oh, great. Thanks. No, that was good to kind of just touch on that point. I think that's a question that's on top of mind as, as cities are being so um, affected by this. Uh, so just to the poll we just ran and something I think that's, that's promising and we'll link into this next question is um, many of you guys said that 
you want to reduce the impact in your personal life and that you really want to be involved going forward. And I think that that is critical now that you can be informed and be more involved going forward so that um, you know we can, as we're, we're highlighting some of these issues, build back better, recover better. Um, so now a question for Julie, which uh, comes from Michelle and asking a little bit about organizationally, what will working from home mean for energy and resources on campus and, and organizations and, 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 you know, in general, what, what do you think that's going to look like? I think that's a great question and something that we're all grappling with at the moment. Um, I mean, just, just this week in the Boston Globe, an article came out starting to look at, you know, what is going to be the impact in um, people's choice with respect to public transportation. And, you know, MIT has a deep commitment to supporting Basically, uh, you know, we, we, there's a great incentive. Um, we subsidize access to public transportation at the moment. So I think as we reconsider how people are gonna be moving to, from and around campus in Cambridge, we're gonna to have to better understand what the opportunities are to integrate work from home policies. Um, so, so that the immediate rebuild option isn't just more garages. So we're going to figure out how to ease back and uh, and understand and get reimagine um, what you know what the next version of sustainable mobility 2.0 looks like, and then I think where work from home policies fit into that. I mean, I think when I when I'm on calls, one thing everyone craves is being together again, you know, and reconnecting and finding places to bump into each other. So. So at least it, again, I can't speak on behalf of MIT, but my, I don't envision us running MIT from our homes um, and particularly while schools are closed. Uh, on the other hand, I, I think that there'll be some interesting ramp ups and we'll have some, I think, I think similar to what Chris said, I think there's gonna be more opportunity for some deeper conversation in terms of um, what that portfolio of options looks like in, and, and uh, how we incentivize uh, how people engage with those portfolio of options. Great, great. Um, so that's great to kind of pr provide some perspectives there that you know, we will you know, probably likely to return to campus, but there will be some, some different options going forward. I'm gonna run one more poll that connects with the question I'm gonna ask Chris right now. Um, so, Reopening the world post COVID, COVID is almost a once in a lifetime opportunity to prioritize environmental issues. And this question comes from Amit, but how do we convince policymakers worldwide not to push this fact to the back of other agendas? Wow, if I knew how to do that, I would, uh, I would I'd probably have- Save the easy one for you. <laughs> yeah, really. Um, I, I think it's gonna, be, it's gonna be tough for one. Um, I, I also think that there'll be some, some more incentives that might drive sustainability in, in sort of unusual ways, even among policymakers that aren't doing it because of sustainability. So one question I have is whether or not, given the, the back to supply chains, given the importance of the supply chain from China to the US, and China to the rest of the world, whether or not we'll start to see pressures for more autarky. Um, which could in principle reduce pollution um, insofar as emissions, say in electricity per kilowatt hour are lower in the US and in Europe than they are in China. Um, if more of that production is done here, um, you, have, you have less shipping and, and uh, fewer emissions up, up the supply chain. We'll see if that's, now I know that's not what everybody was hoping for and that's not really the front and center way we would want to deal with climate change, but that one of the one of the byproducts of policies like that would be to reduce emissions. Um, beyond that, it's really going to be trying to convince policymakers of the threats of climate change and trying to make parallels, although John's caveats are good, of you know. One of my friends referred to COVID-19 as sort of climate change on steroids. Um, and there's lots of differences, um, but everything was ramped up, right? Climate change is happening over centuries or over decades and COVID-19 was happening over days. Um, there still is that negative externality piece to it. So um, there, there are some links that one can make. There's still the strong science link and the, um, 
policies that, that try to overcome those negative externalities. I guess I, I'll just end that my hope is that policymakers will see those connections um, and, and be more likely to uh, do something about them. Great. Now, I, th I know that was not the, the easy question, but I think that provides some insights there. And, um, you know, just to think about uh, what the audience is thinking related, which is, you know, to this question, how do you think COVID-19 will impact commitment to sustainability individually, organizationally, or governmentally? Um, by and large, many of you said it will force society to rethink what they value. So I think that that is going to be top of mind as we as we move forward. Um, so this question from Kurt, I'm just going to kind of open up and, and see, you know, and I'll, I'll kind of say who wants to go first or dive at it first, but recognizing, you know, there's a lot of barriers, but what can we do as individuals to drive institution institutional commitment to near term goals in line with what the science says around climate change, when we don't know exactly how to achieve it. And I don't know if uh, who wants to take a stab at that first another easy one. Can I, can I um, answer um, guessing what Chris would say? <laughs> sure. Vote. Vote, yep. I mean, I, I think you've answered that question in, in another context, Chris. That's why I'm, I'm venturing to, to suggest that, uh, or I'm obviously interested in your ideas. But one, one quick point about that. Uh, on, on the topic, the general topic of one, what one can do as an individual versus not. So um, you can do a lot as, a, as an individual. And as we've shown collectively, we can do a lot collectively as individuals, but there's some things we can't change. So we can't change as individuals, the fuel mix of the electric grid. Um, that has to come from industry and really from regulation and, and things like pricing carbon. So, so there. Are, so, as an individual, again, I, I go back to the, the answer being, you know, vote as being the the way in which to really um, uh, affect the, the the larger landscape. Anyone else want to chime in on that one? I think John channeled my thoughts exactly. Oh, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> Great, great. No, I think that was, a, you know, definitely thinking about your role as individuals, please. Uh, you know, voting is, is critical here. So um, so I think we're running up on the hour. I just wanted to, um, I, there are many questions um, that we are not getting to. I'll, I'll look through one more, but, um, you know, one thing to mo move forward is, you know, we here at MIT are, are looking to think about what can be useful in this time period. So I just am running a quick poll on what kind of information you might like going forward, another session like this where we get to dig into some of the, the things that, that Chris and John and others have, and, John, and Julie have mentioned, but we didn't get to, you know, obviously there's a lot of unknown, but is there a way we can continue to connect with you um, and, and take some of these um, themes going forward? So there's too many questions to, um, to kind of sum up what we want to get out of this, but I think that I just wanna ask each of the participants to give sort of a, a final, statement perspective on on this time period knowing you know that we're rethinking our values we're rethinking our role as individuals as communities as organizations can you just say a final phrase statement about what people can take away from this uh going forward and just start with julie real quickly i guess i just have two points one is uh, as i mentioned i think we need to rethink leadership and figure out what is the new leadership model we need to both address short-term needs and long-term strategic planning. And there's some excellent questions that are raised. I think we all have so many of the same questions around, you know, how do you prioritize and revalue the role of human health and environment uh, in policy making, decision making, supply chain management. So um, I, I'll just leave it at that time wise. Thanks. Perfect. Leadership. Thank you, so new new leadership models and collaborations. Yes, right. Um, yes, I like that theme that you pull out of kind of these new collaborative leadership uh, paradigms that we're going to have to think about. Uh, John. And um, uh, an optimistic note on public on the public. So I read yesterday in The Guardian that a very small number of Britons, I think it was, I think it was 9% want um, things to go back to the way they were. There, there are lots of things that they don't like about business as usual. And so there is, there is an enormous appetite for change. 
And I do think that we can leverage that. I'll leave it at that. Wonderful. No, exactly. That do do we want to go back to normal? I think that's a really important. What can we what can we do better going forward? And and finally, Chris. Yeah, I'll I'll just say I think two things that this crisis has stressed to me is just how interconnected we are, um, not just within a country but uh, globally, um, and that obviously ties with how interconnected we are from a climate perspective, um, and somewhat tongue in cheek, but um, it has also underscored how poor decision making can exacerbate problems. <laughs> um, and um, so hopefully we can learn from that going forward. Absolutely. No, thank you for the, those final words. I think each of those really kind of frames the, the things we're going to be thinking about going forward, our interconnectedness, um, how we really have to think critically and make science-based decisions and, and how we can move forward better. So um, I know we're at the hour. Thank you for spending an hour on your Earth Day with all of us. And, and thank you for our expert panelists. This has been really insightful. And I think gauging from the poll that, you know, maybe more sessions like this going a little bit deeper on certain topics might be of use. So we'll certainly consider that internally. But thank you all for joining today and, and stay safe and healthy out there and, and stay committed. Happy Earth Day. Happy Earth Day. Thank you. Happy Earth Day. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Good everyone. Good to see everybody. Bye.